Welcome everybody to this Electrophysiology PIA webinar. So this webinar is um, an extension of a recent talk that we had from Professor Claudio Babiloni entitled Hansberger's Dream, Alzheimer's Disease Affects EEG Rhythms and Vigilance. And we had such great attendance at this event and so many questions that we couldn't get to all of them. And so Claudio has kindly agreed to join us again along with my colleague, Xiang Hong Arakaki from the EPIA committee uh, to answer these questions for you. So I'll just give a brief introduction again to Claudio and then we'll jump into the questions. So Claudio received his PhD in biomedical sciences and is associate professor of physiology at the Sapienza University of Rome. His group investigates neurophysiological brain rhythms underpinning the, re the regulation of vigilance and cognitive functions in aging with a focus on Alzheimer's disease. He's currently the chair of the ISTART Electrophysiology Professional Interest Area and senior co-chair of the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology Working Group on Advanced EEG Techniques in Clinical Neurophysiology. So Claudio, thank you so much for joining and I'll invite you now to share your screen. Thanks a lot, Francesca, for this nice uh, uh, presentation. I, um, I thank again uh, Istat for this uh, unique opportunity to um, discuss the, the, the issue of uh, electrophysiology, biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, particularly uh, electroencephalographic resting state biomarkers in Alzheimer's disease. Great, so I'm gonna jump straight into the questions because we have a lot to get through. Um, so the first question is coming from Yang Jiang and they start by saying really great talk and I think everybody will agree, anybody who attended. Um, and she asks, the idea that resting state EEG is a progressive biomarker is very novel. How stable are resting state EEG signals such as alpha at the individual level from one day to another? Yes, this is uh, really important uh, to, for the qualification of resting state EEG biomarkers. Um, the, you see that uh, resting state EEG biomarkers uh, are uh, capturing uh, the attention of uh, many researchers in the field. Uh, you can uh, quickly record the resting state EEG at eyes closed and eyes open in a few minutes. And um, these biomarkers are sensitive to the brain systems regulating brain arousal and vigilance in quiet wakefulness and transition between vigilance uh, states uh, from consciousness to drowsiness. And um, uh, Hans Bergers, uh, um, was a German psychiatrist, was the first to record the resting state EG in humans uh, in, uh, at the beginning of last century. And uh, in this slide, you can see the alpha rims, which is the dominant oscillations of EG activity in the resting state eyes closed condition. And you can recall this ample alpha rims in the posterior regions of the skull. And you see that uh, if you uh, move from to uh, a task related uh, activity, a cognitive activity, you have uh, uh, the disappearance of alpha rims in the scalp and um, you can see higher frequencies in the EG activity, for example, from beta to gamma from 20 to 80 Hertz. And uh, you, you are right that uh, uh, one application of EG biomarkers is uh, on uh, disease progression monitoring over time. For example, clinical trials, uh, uh, testing intervention. And uh, I uh, presented during the talk the, the um, uh, results of comparison of first recording and after one year in Alzheimer's disease uh, patients with dementia. And you see in the screen, the results in the vertical axis, you have the uh, source uh, activity in uh, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. In Alzheimer's disease patients with dementia, the first recording is in blue and the, the follow-up after one year is in red. And you see that after one year, 
you have a decrease in alpha readings, so very clear, and also a statistical increase of uh, delta uh, readings. And uh, similar results you can obtain also in Alzheimer's disease with my cognitive impairment, so in the prodromal stage of dementia. And you can see in blue the first recording in baseline, in red the second recording after one year. And uh, you see that the source activation in parietal occipital and temporal areas are reduced after one year. This is the uh, bioma AG biomarkers of disease progression. And uh, of course, one important thing is that you have stability of uh, EG biomarkers in resting state in the same subjects, uh, for example, after one day or after some weeks. Uh, or, and uh, in a healthy adults, uh, you have uh, several publications showing that uh, you have a high correlation between uh, EG um, biomarkers in resting state condition, the spectral biomarkers, power density of AG oscillations. And you see that the year correlation coefficients uh, from uh, 0.8 to 0.9 after five minutes, four weeks or one year. And um, you can obtain stable alpha power density in a given subject uh, with uh, 20 seconds of uh, e resting state EG recordings in ice closed and similar to 40 seconds, uh, uh, 60 seconds and so on. So a short recording give you a stable resting state EG biomarker. Mm -hmm. Incredibly important for any biomarker. The next question comes from Nicola Zoppi. Um, and they ask, how many electrodes minimum do you think are necessary to capture an accurate image of cortical activity in, for example, Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body dementia? Yeah, this is a, a really important uh, hot topic uh, uh, to set up a clinical trial in Alzheimer's disease with the resting state EEG. In the slide, you see that you have uh, three montages. So one is the classical clinical electrode montage use, uh, um, for example, in a research of my group, and uh, you use 19 electrodes according to 1020 montage system. Now we have uh, additional six electrodes in the literature uh, to, to have a uh, um, representation of frontal and temporal lateral regions. This is not uh, really uh, suggested for EG source analysis uh, in, uh, in uh, new prospective uh, clinical trials. Um, we encourage the use of uh, more electrodes. In, for example, you have the 1010 system of electrode montage using 81 electrodes in order to have uh, a, a good mapping of the cortical sources of resting state EG and also event-related uh, potentials. And uh, for example, for other clinical applications in epilepsy, you can also increase the number of electrodes. And um, concerning the, uh, the software to analyze the data, I, my suggestion is the use of uh, open access toolboxes for the analysis of uh, uh, resting state EEG, because these allow other groups to, to replicate the results of your research. And in the case of um, uh, applications uh, uh, to Alzheimer's disease, uh, several groups use uh, Loreta freeware that you can download from this uh, uh, link in, uh, in, uh, in internet. And uh, you see that you can uh, use artifact-free EG periods of resting state EG as an input to uh, Loretta freeware and to obtain solution at voxel level. And you can average the, the, the voxel solutions in uh, uh, regions of interest. In, in the research of my group, we use large regions of interest due to the use of only 19 electrodes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you uh, uh, can, uh, the, in the literature, you have uh, um, nice demonstrations that uh, um, 
you can use two um, different uh, toolboxes for the EG source estimation and obtain similar results. And um, you see in the slide, uh, we mentioned uh, some papers uh, that uh, demonstrated the, the uh, reliability of uh, cortical uh, EEG source estimations from different techniques. And uh, particularly in this slide, you see that uh, you can have some techniques uh, in using uh, uh, mathematical head models and the mathematical models of the sources to have this kind of uh, uh, estimation. Or you can use uh, surface Laplacian or uh, current density estimation. Uh, which are spatial filter uh, trying to increase the, the, the spatial details of the maxima uh, over the scalp. And um, so my suggestion and to, to use uh, more than one technique to have a cortical source mapping and to compare the results to obtain cross-validation. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to see you know, how far we've come from Hans Berger in one way to hear you talk about all of these mathematical models now. Um, the next question is from Wen Tao Li, and I think you've largely answered this, but maybe you'll want to add um, an additional comment. So they ask, assuming the same electrical layout, for example, the 1020 montage, but different data acquisition software and hardware, are the Loretta solution topography still comparable? What are some of the main limitations of doing such a comparison? And then I think you've largely answered that, but lastly, what are your impressions of commercially available normative EEG data sets, such as NeuroGuide and QEEG Pro? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is really uh, an interesting point. And uh, um, I suggest that uh, in, the, in the use of uh, different, EG equipments uh, to record uh, EG data, you uh, use the calibration procedure in order to be sure that you have the voltages comparable with different equipments. But uh, uh, of course, you can also use some uh, um, uh, procedure to improve the, the reliability of your clinical trial with resting state EG, for example, using uh, comparable numbers of uh, Alzheimer's disease patients and the healthy controls uh, for any uh, equipment, any clinical unit of your multicentric study in order to have a control that you have similar effects or the same effect in different clinical units using different equipments to record EEG. Another interesting uh, suggestion for, for multicentric studies is to use uh, new devices uh, injecting uh, voltages in the electrodes uh, in the preliminary stage uh, in order to obtain uh, um, preformed electrical activity at the electrode level. And so you know the, the frequencies, the spectral profile, uh, the amplitude, because they are uh, preformed in the device. And uh, you can test uh, if your recording system is able to amplify all the frequencies uh, properly. Um, another another um, suggestion is the use of a combat platform is a toolbox that you can download from internet that uh, um, is used for neuroimaging multicentric studies in order to harmonize the, the images uh, um, using magnetic resonance imaging. But you can, in my lab, we also um, showed some beneficial effect on resting state EEG activity data recorded from different clinical units. So I suggest that you also use combat uh, freeware. Great. Another question that is um, related. So some, uh, Dylan Mann Krisnik has asked, what advantages could MEG bring in comparison to EEG for studying Alzheimer's disease 
aside from a higher number of sensors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you are right that uh, new magnetoencephalographic equipments allow you to record from a lot of uh, uh, sensors, magnetometers, and um, hundreds uh, and hundreds. And uh, this is really useful to have uh, source estimations, even because the magnetic counterpart of the source activity is able to, to go through the brain, meninges, skull and scalp with the same penetration, electrical penetration. And uh, so you don't have the, the uh, deformation of uh, um, the field across these tissues from the cortical sources to sensors. So I encourage the use of magnetoencephalographic equipments and uh, to have the mapping of the sources uh, in, uh, in Alzheimer's disease patients at different stages. Um, on the other hand, we, we, we need to uh, compare continuously the results of magnetoencephalographic um, um, devices and the elect and the mag with electroencephalographic devices uh, due to the fact that uh, um, you don't have a lot of magnetoencephalographic equipments uh, in the world, especially in uh, lower and middle income countries. However, I have to acknowledge the important contribution of some research groups using magnetoencephalographic uh, uh, procedures on the um, uh, source analysis of resting state EG in relation to amyloid deposition or um, uh, brain atrophy and, and so on, especially the studies on uh, cortical functional connectivity. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm going to pass over to my colleague now to continue with the questions. Xiang Hong? <laughs> yes. There's so many questions, so we have to split. <laughs> okay, so next question is from uh, asking by uh, like quite a few people, similar. Uh, Mario, Para, Heiki, Tanila, and Thomas Fritsch. They also mentioned a great talk, Claudio, really encouraging. What about the specificity of resting EEG in a differential diagnosis among different types of dementia? Also, the frontal temporal dementia, who also exists, exhibit memory and language deficits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a really uh, one point of the qualification of uh, EG biomarkers uh, is uh, uh, try to demonstrate that you have uh, different profiles in the frequencies and uh, in the spatial regions. Um, when you compare resting state EEG biomarkers in uh, people with different uh, neuropathologies uh, bringing to dementia. And uh, in, uh, during the talk, I presented this uh, study from uh, my group showing that uh, compared to normal elderly subjects, the first row, red means uh, activity in the source space, nose up, you see that in the normal elderly subjects, the dominant source activity is in the posterior cortical regions in the alpha frequency. And then you have a, a dramatic uh, decrease in Alzheimer's disease patients with my dementia in relation to uh, patients with cerebrovascular dementia with diffuse small vessel um, diseases in the white matter and they have a, a reasonable alpha source activity uh, preserved even with the same global cognitive deficits of um, our group of uh, mild dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. And so this is a demonstration that you can have different um, abnormalities uh, in the sources of resting state EG, even if you have similar global cognitive activity. And um, I also presented the results uh, of uh, some studies. Uh, this is one slide uh, summarizing that uh, you can have a different 
source ED profile uh, with different groups of uh, patients with dementia due to Alzheimer's disease in red, Parkinson's disease in green, and Levy body disease in violet. And you see that compared to uh, normal elderly subjects in blue with the dominant and maximum uh, alpha source activities in parietal occipital and temporal uh, areas in the in the source model of Iloreta, of course. And uh, um, you see a reduction of uh, alpha source activity in the posterior regions in uh, Parkinson disease and then Levy body and the dramatic drop in Alzheimer's disease with dementia. And so this is a, a demonstration that uh, you can have uh, at the group level different uh, uh, different uh, um, AG source activity in the resting state. You, you see also some differences uh, in delta with increasing abnormal delta source activity in the posterior areas uh, in Parkinson's disease, then uh, in uh, Levy body, and then in Alzheimer's disease patients. So you have some specificity at the group level. We also showed uh, applied some uh, uh, um, computation of areas under the, the rock curve uh, to test uh, the, the possibility to disentangle individuals of different uh, um, uh, diseases bringing to dementia based on resting state EG source activity. And you see some example with the, uh, a biomarker from biotypical delta ratio alpha estimated with the uh, Loretta platform. And you see that in this specific and fortunate case, we had the high classification accuracy when we compare normal elderly subjects with Alzheimer's disease with dementia, Parkinson's disease with dementia, and dementia with Levy bodies, and also some moderate accuracy uh, between uh, Alzheimer's disease with dementia and Parkinson's disease with dementia. Um, Concerning vascular dementia, we, I admit that uh, we have uh, um, results uh, um, in which alpha was uh, preserved, uh, but uh, this is the case of diffuse vascular lesions in the white matter and uh, maybe not applied to other kinds of vascular uh, dementing disorders with the lacuna uh, stroke activity or different patterns. But the basic principle is that uh, if you vascular, this is a, um, uh, a result of uh, Fernando Lopez da Silva, uh, who was the, uh, an, important, uh, an important scientist in the field of uh, EG uh, uh, science. And uh, he could demonstrate with simultaneous recordings of resting state, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and uh, uh, resting state EG, that uh, the alpha rims uh, is uh, uh, correlated negatively with the, the bold uh, fMRI response in the posterior areas. So if you have some vascular lesions uh, um, in, the, in, in the posterior cortical areas or in the white matter connection to posterior cortical areas, you can have some derangement of alpha rims as well. So it depends on the, on, on the kind of vascular uh, disease uh, um, you, you are investigating. Yeah, thank you, that's amazing. <laughs> I think it, you might already answer most of the question. I'm gonna read from Chris, right? So he asked, you show that um, attached figure are suggesting that vascular dementia has less of an impact on posterior alpha versus Alzheimer's disease. We were wondering if that was related to a specific form of vascular dementia and also how vascular disease in AD might interact with the alpha signal loss. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I understand the point. And uh, um, I, I, I can come back to the slide that would show that uh, um, uh, in this particular study with this kind of uh, patients with cerebrovascular dementia, we obtain also an increase uh, in uh, uh, theta frequency in the sources. You see that more red uh, in the vascular dementia patients when compared to Alzheimer's disease with mild dementia. And um, so in, in, uh, 
the, the core message of this specific study was that uh, the, the white matter vascular lesions may be related to abnormal generation of uh, theta rhythms in the resting state eyes closed. So in some way, you can have some different uh, impact uh, in the generation of alpha and theta frequencies uh, uh, when you have some uh, um, cerebrovascular disease. And if you have a mixed dementia with uh, Alzheimer's neurodegeneration and uh, vascular disease, you can have a box, um, an abnormal increase in theta and delta uh, even in the early stages uh, due to the cerebrovascular component. So ideally you should always uh, map uh, magnetic resonance imaging, uh, T1 for the neurodegeneration and T2 weighted for the um, cerebrovascular lesions uh, in order to disentangle these components. Oh, okay, thank you. We learned so much just by listening to the answers. Uh, Chris also have a, um, another question is, are there differences in alpha responses depending on the nature of the central nervous system vascular disease? For example, hemispheric strokes versus subcortical small vessel disease. I fully agree with this comment and uh, um... So it's uh, very important that you map the cerebrovascular lesions and to also uh, to describe the uh, etiology of the lesions in order to have the picture, the, uh, the whole picture uh, and the interpretation of uh, changes uh, in alpha, theta and delta sources. Yeah, thank you. So next also, um, in addition to the differential diagnosis, Thomas French also asked, he commented a very good talk. Uh, did you investigate lateral differences for ADPD, uh, Lewy body disease and uh, uh, healthy controls? I mean, for instance, left alpha versus right alpha or other frequency bands. Is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, this is a really interesting topic. Uh, uh, as you can see from the slide, we, uh, were forced to average the left and the right hemisphere to reduce the number of regions of interest in relation to the low number of electrodes uh, uh, during the resting state EG recordings, 19 electrodes and uh, just uh, uh, six macro regions of interest in the, in the cortical source space. So uh, I agree that uh, it's interesting to, to also to investigate uh, the different hemispheres. Um, and for example, based on the use of a higher number of ele scalp electrodes. In, in, uh, in our um, attempt to uh, compare um, EG source solutions in the left versus right hemisphere, we didn't see statistically significant effects, but this may be due to the low number of electrodes at the scalp level. So it's nice to repeat these experiments with more electrodes and uh, smaller cortical regions of interest in the left and right hemisphere. In, uh, in the literature, the asymmetry of uh, frontal alpha rings, uh, but also other, other uh, uh, regions uh, more recently were sensitive to depression, major depression in uh, patients. Uh, and also they were sensitive to responsivity to some uh, pharmacological interventions in patients with major depression. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease field, uh, there is no converging evidence that, that these asymmetries are uh, are, are um, uh, especially important uh, as biomarkers, but but I encourage new 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 studies on this topic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next question is from Alexandra Battaglia Mayer, um, said, "Congratulations! First, are there evidence of this EEG biomarkers on monkeys 
monkey models of Alzheimer's. And myself is interested. Are they also biomarking dogs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I, I, I see that we in the in a European uh, project uh, called Pharmacog, um, granted by European Committee and uh, European Federation on Pharmaceutical and uh, Industry uh, Companies. Uh, we uh, recorded EG from uh, humans, of course, uh, and uh, mice, my uh, transgenic mouse models of Alzheimer's disease, amyloidosis, and property, and also in uh, uh, subhuman primates, uh, the gray lemurs. They are uh, similar to monkeys in some way, and um, and they are primates. And uh, we could observe that uh, the, the typical structure of uh, rest, ongoing EG, resting state EG in humans uh, with uh, a big alpha peak during uh, passive conditions in wakefulness and then a reduction of alpha during activity was replicated in the lemurs. So this means that this is something related to thalamocortical architecture in, uh, in primates. But we obtain different results in mice, for example, they don't have a big alpha peak in the EG during uh, um, uh, passive wakefulness. And um, there was no reduction during uh, exploratory movements. Instead, we had a peak of delta EG in the passive wakefulness and the increase of theta peak, not to decrease, increase of theta peak during uh, uh, exploratory movements in mice. And so I think that uh, 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 it's a very important the translational research across species uh, in order to capture the best models uh, to test uh, new drugs uh, at the early stages of drug discovery. Uh, concerning the dog, the dog, uh, um, uh, uh, they were not used recently for for research uh, um, in um, neurodegenerative diseases, but uh, um, it's very important the contribution of experiments in dogs in order to um, establish that uh, alpha rings are generated across the layers of the cerebral cortex. Uh, these were uh, important studies by Fernando Lopez da Silva in the last century, in the previous century. Thank you. Um, I'm going to hand the questions to Francesca. <laughs> Thanks. We're nearly there, Claudia. We're almost a few more. Um, so the next question comes from Joseph Farley, um, and it relates back to uh, the results that you showed. So aside from the loss of acetylcholine, what other transmitters, co-transmitters, growth factors, peptides, etc., do you think might be diminished in the pathways that you, you're speaking about? and that might account for the poor success of cholinergic therapies for Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, yeah, this is really important. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's now uh, at the center of my research interest in this field, because we could demonstrate, for example, in Parkinson's disease patients with cognitive deficits, that if you give uh, uh, one dose of uh, levodopa, so an agonist of dopaminergic system, you have uh, changes uh, in uh, delta and alpha, but surprisingly, you have a reduction of delta, and this is uh, uh, expected because some improvement in the system, uh, ascending system, but you have a decrease of alpha, paradoxically. And this is maybe related to the excitatory reaction of uh, dopa, L-dopa on the thalamocortical systems. So this means that the dopaminergic ascending systems and cholinergic ascending system uh, can have different impact on the generation of alpha, even opposite impact. And so you need this kind of studies in order to uh, decompose cortical alpha rings in the resting state in the cholinergic and dopaminergic and serotoninergic uh, ascending, activating systems. 
Another point is peptides, and uh, I see that uh, BDNF can have a, a big impact uh, explaining the variability of resting state EG in different people with different genetic variants of the genes expressing BDNF or transported of dopamine or transported of serotonin. So I think that these genetic EEG studies will be crucial, uh, not only to understand the, the different responsivity of people with different genotyping to uh, the drugs, symptomatic drugs to improve attention and memory uh, in, uh, in um, the field of uh, dementia, but also for the basic understanding of ascending activating systems uh, uh, regulating the, the, the EEG. I, I see that uh, Hans Berger's uh, would love understanding how cholinergic, dopaminergic, serotoninergic, or ascending systems are able to modulate differently alpha rhythms. Mm -hmm. Our next question is from our own Mihaili Hajos. Uh, he says, fascinating talk, Claudio. Curious to know if a correlation has been established between EEG and functional abilities, such as activities of daily living. Yeah, yeah, you are right that uh, this is the core, <laughs> the, the core interest in a clinical trial that people after the intervention are able to do something more than before the intervention in the daily living. This is uh, really important for patients, for, for uh, patients' families, uh, and also for researchers. In, uh, um, there are, there are uh, several studies. I mentioned one of uh, the Amsterdam group uh, showing the prediction of um, uh, decline in um, abilities of daily living based on uh, resting state EG biomarkers in, uh, in a baseline uh, recording. And um, in my group uh, could demonstrate that uh, anti-inflammatory non-corticosteroid uh, uh, drugs uh, given for one year in uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease and dementia were able to reduce partially the, the increase, uh, abnormal increase of uh, delta source activity after one year. And uh, in relation to measurement of activities of daily living. So there are several demonstrations that uh, uh, there is a correlation between the resting state EG biomarkers and cognitive functions, but also, of course, the impact on uh, abilities of daily living. Mm -hmm. Great. So one thing we haven't really talked about yet is task-based EEG. So a few people are interested in this. We had questions from Letizia Leocani and Fabian Schwimbeck and also Carl Sadowski. And I know, Xiang Hong, you may have some data that can speak to this as well. So the questions are, do you think adding a task would increase our sensitivity to specific cognitive dysfunctions? Um, and specifically, have you looked at P300, P3A and P3B? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is uh, I. This is really important because uh, EG biomarkers are a family larger than the resting state as close and as open, and we have a, a well-established paradigms to test EG activity, uh, so brain electrical activity in response to memory episodic memory, short and. Uh, uh, medium-term memory or a uh, focus attention uh, or uh, for example detection of words uh, and speeches and so you can map uh, uh, operating uh, cognitive systems uh, during EG recordings uh, in uh, especially in patients with uh, uh, my cognitive impairment uh, that are able to follow the uh, cognitive paradigms uh, during EG recordings but also mild dementia. You have a lot of papers and studies 
um, in which the, the, the patients with my dementia and Alzheimer's disease were able to perform some cognitive tasks during EG recordings. So for example, oddball paradigm in which you give frequent auditory or visual stimuli and in uh, 20 or 30 percent of cases, uh, you have uh, you give oddball stimuli, and the subject has to count mentally or push the bottom every time he perceive um, he perceives the uh, visual or auditory stimuli, and uh, you have some uh, event-related potentials, so positive and negative peaks ample in the EG. Uh, activity, ongoing IG activity of your brisk changes in the amplitude of alpha and uh, beta rims, the event related desynchronization of alpha and beta rims or synchronization where you have an increase. And um, there are a lot of uh, studies uh, showing that uh, oddball paradigms or um, episodic memory or working memory paradigms were able to. Uh, depict the cognitive system operating the cerebral cortex uh, in patients with my cognitive impairment and dementia due to Alzheimer's disease and of course preclinical stages. But uh, Siavong developed some of these studies. So uh, Siavong, if if, well, if you want to comment on this question, yes, I'll be happy to share. So we we found in. Uh, Cognitive healthy participants, they're elderly participants. And all these people are uh, cognitive healthy, but they some of them have abnormal amyloid tau in the CSF. Some are normal. So those with abnormal CSF, they have higher um, risk of developing cognitive impairment in three or four years, as in our longitudinal study. So we found that during a working memory challenge, we give them uh, them back. And we found that like a zero back is a low workload uh, and the alpha ERD event related desynchronization was more negative in those people with pathological amyloid tau level. So that shows the people who have higher risk for Alzheimer's or cognitive decline, they uh, perform mm, poorly, even though the behaviorally the accuracy response time, they're pretty comparable between the two groups but brain processing show they are actually working harder. So the EEG is really a good um, tool to show up the subtle, <laughs> to reveal the abnormality, yeah. yeah I fully agree. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, we've mentioned memory tasks and oddball tasks. One of the more recent ones would be the visual working memory binding task, which I think is showing some really interesting findings as well in people who behaviorally, like you said, Zhang Hong, are looking the same, um, but may have genetic risk for dementia, right? So I think, yeah, the um, the the literature on task-based EEG is growing and growing. Um, okay, moving on to our next question, um, which is related. So it's from Greg, Mac Greg McGillis. What role does connectivity play in the use of EEG to diagnose AD? Connectivity, the other thing in the family we haven't spoken about, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm very sorry uh, with a lot of uh, uh, research groups uh, who demonstrated the, the, the importance to understand the, the functional cortical connectivity from uh, EEG and uh, magnetoencephalographic data and the resting state or during uh, cognitive tasks because uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, is a disease of cognitive systems uh, and uh, cognition is related to uh, connectivity between different areas, uh, synchronization of, of activity in different areas. So these uh, uh, procedures are important to understanding the impact of Alzheimer's disease neuropathology on the brain. And uh, there are a lot of examples of uh, changes in this connectivity and more recently also in the topology of these uh, uh, networks uh, from uh, EEG and, and magnetoencephalographic biomarkers based on uh, graph theory. Um, and uh, so I uh, am very sorry that I, I did not get into more details during my webinar but you can find a lot of demonstrations that uh, this is uh, 
an emerging uh, an emerging uh, um, topic uh, uh, in Alzheimer's disease and neurophysiology. Uh, for example, um, one important uh, hot topic uh, is uh, the derangement of uh, the so-called default mode networks uh, in, um, uh, in, the, in, in, in the cortical, uh, in the cerebral cortex of patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there are a lot of evidence that uh, the hub uh, in the posterior cingulate cortex and the connectivity with other frontal and parietal areas uh, can derange during Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, progression. And uh, EG and the rest in, during the resting state condition is potentially able to capture these changes uh, in the default mode network with uh, high density electrode montages and proper cortical source estimations. Mm -hmm. I think you couldn't have possibly covered everything in an hour, um, so we may just have to get you back again to speak to us and, uh, and talk to us about connectivity, but I think a lot of what we've talked about here, the methodology and understanding the methodology and the validation and the replication, all speaks to the connectivity, you know, um, and builds on that. Okay, we've got one last question before I hand back over to Xiang Hong, and it's from Sanjeev Kumar. Can you comment on what would be the value of adding EEG to existing, <clears throat> to existing biomarkers in treatment trials? Can it help predict response to treatment and can it help detect asymptomatic disease as we are learning that disease modifying treatments probably need to start early? Yeah, 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 absolutely. We, we have uh, um, a lot of uh, examples that uh, uh, resting state EEG biomarkers uh, uh, are uh, related to uh, several important features of Alzheimer's disease, such as uh, the changes uh, in A-beta-42 and phosphotau in the cerebrospinal fluid, but also the correlation with uh, the cortical gray matter um, volume and so the cortical uh, neurodegeneration. And uh, concerning the the um, use of uh, resting state EEG biomarkers um, during uh, pharmacological clinical trials, uh, my group um, showed the, the how uh, responders to one year of uh, cholinergic therapy with genepazil, um, responders of patients with Alzheimer's disease dementia, uh, showed less uh, reduction of uh, alpha source activity in posterior regions after one year when compared to non-responders to, to, to donepazil therapy. We also showed some effects of anti-inflammatory non-corticosteroid therapy after one year with the less increase of uh, uh, widespread uh, delta sources. And the Amsterdam group um, showed um, the sensitivity of a cortical functional connectivity AG biomarkers to new pharmacological treatments in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So definitively, we have a, a powerful neurophysiological biomarkers for disease progression and therapy response for Alzheimer's disease clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Incredible, Claudia. We've gone from peptides to cross-species EEG studies to connectivities of clinical trials. It's incredible breadth of, of work that you've done and, and is being carried out in the field. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pass back over to Xiang Hong now to close us out. Yeah, thank you. This is so much learning and I enjoy the encyclopedia <laughs> type of <laughs> learning. Um, okay, so the last question from Chris Wright is she asked about, would you mind sending us a copy of the slides? I think as we can answer is uh, we will put I start, we'll put the talk on their website and we will also share the slides on our own uh, EPR LinkedIn group. And uh, this, is, this will be open to both members and non-members, right? Available, yeah, so we, we're able to access. Um, and thank you all for attending. I hope everyone will learn as much as I do. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we um, thank all the audience and the audio for the, really rich information. Um, we have a journal club coming in July 1st. 
and hope everyone can join us. And hope, um, our, the interest group, group growing bigger and bigger, we can all engage our interests and learn together to improve our research. And this is really a fantastic community that I joined. I, I learned so much to improve my knowledge and the uh, stress of work. <laughs> and uh, thank you all and I uh, hope to see you soon in July 1st. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone.